physics of Titan. So don't worry, this is not a lecture, although I'm, I'm a lecturer. <laughs> so I hope um, you will enjoy my talk. So uh, this talk is a focus uh, on how we uh, use Python to teach our uh, students at University of Malaya, especially at the Department of Physics. Okay, so uh, our emphasis is uh, since a Python is quite a popular language nowadays, so we want to uh, encourage our students uh, to try to, to code or to write a program themselves and to see that how they can visualize a physics problem in uh, by using some uh, visualization. Okay, so from here uh, we are trying to what they call it. Uh, to guide students and after that I'm going to talk a bit about what I did for my research. <coughs> okay, so uh, so this is uh, uh, what I call it, my Twitter account, my to my email, feel free to get in touch with me. So I would like to thank to the organizer for giving me chance to talk at this wonderful conference. This is my first PyCon Malaysia and I would like to thank to all my Twitter followers for encouraging me to, to apply for to, uh, to talk at this uh, PyCon. Okay, so first of all, why computation is important in physics? Okay, so this is um, what they call it uh, some a nice GIF is uh, what they call it. This is um, being uh, constructed by using a quantum mechanic. This is an orbital angular momentum of an electron. Okay, so this is being visualized by Python, right? So the student able to use what they learn in their undergraduates and then visualize how does the one that you see in the textbook and all, everything through like a 3D image like this, right? So this is one thing that we want to encourage our students to try and to do what they can visualize from their physics because physics is something that you have to think, to imagine what are these things, how to solve it, everything. But in the end, students need something like a guidance for them to see how these things work, right? So this is our idea. And also uh, in um, physics or in the scientific work, we can see that we have um, what they call it some uh, difficulty in doing experiment. So computational will is the answer to solve this, right? <coughs> so in physics, we have two branches of um, what they call it a research area. One is theoretical physics, which is I am a theoretical physicist where I do simulation of stars okay so and then we have experimental physicists where people who do experiment assembling things to prove some physics theory okay so these two branch is uh, has been a um, very long time uh, since um, the what they call it the classical uh, what they call it physics so now when we have a uh, more technology so we move to one more solid branch of physics what we call as a computational physics this is where people use computers back in probably in 1930s or something, try to construct a stellar evolution, try to do some uh, what they call it galaxy evolution by using computers. Can you imagine people using a very, uh, what they call it, the computer power is far more smaller than your smartphone long, long time ago. And they even use a very ancient language to do all this uh, computational physics, okay? So from here, nowadays, since we have all the computing power, or this fantastic uh, software and something, we should able to ask the student to uh, visualize or to solve their problem by using this technique. And the only thing that you need is just a computer or your laptop or maybe your smartphone. Okay, so sometimes experimental physics require a lot of instrument, which is more, far more expensive. I don't say that computational physics is cheap, yeah? so it can be expensive, especially if you are uh, you have to use, uh, for example, a high performance computing. Right, so that will be a different thing, okay? So for, for example, how does uh, computational physics work? So this is, I'm not sure whether you know it or not, this is what we call as Einstein's uh, field equation, where people try to prove, for example, the black hole, okay? So, and this is a very nice visualization by the USL, UCLA Galactic Center Group, where they visualize from the, uh, this is from data from telescope, they visualize how the black hole, what they call it, uh, at the center here, and all these are the binary star, which is uh, rotating uh, at the center. Okay, so how does it work? Okay, so from here, from the formulation, people will try to build some experimental setup, a LIGO. This is a LIGO interferometry setup, where it uh, now is uh, won the Nobel Prize, I think, last two, three years ago, 2000. 
7C where they able to detect the black hole by using interferometry they put at our uh, what call it the sky our uh, the near to to detect <coughs> the signal from the uh, binary star okay so at the same time um, people in the theoretical physics simulate this uh, what they call it uh, the binary black hole that <coughs> has been curved into a space time curvature okay so from there these two things has been evolved much together to provide this fantastic result where, where the experimental and theoretical being combined plus with the computational uh, what they call it uh, technology and also the technique the physics behind it and we able to produce this kind of work right <coughs> so come back to what i did so i did this uh, this a very uh, what they call it simple i don't know simple thing so for my work my research so I do this, I have to solve all this differential equation. You can see all this uh, lot of equation here. So we solve all this simultaneously with time from zero until what time that you want and to produce the star that behind here. Not this, this is only the comparison. And this work has been uh, published by the ESO back in 2010. We do a press release of this uh, thing. So this is technically from the textbook the equation. So we evolve some a very massive star, okay? and we try to compare with the observation done by the large telescope and all these things are being done purely by using compet computational okay so but not yet uh, we don't use python for this one because <laughs> why <laughs> okay so uh, why we don't use python because python is during that time unable to handle a large data array we need a fast large data array because when we do the data crunching we calculate all this formulation <coughs> we need a high performance computing so we calculate all this thing within um, a month and to produce like i don't know millions of uh, data which is around i think for one model we produce around three terab uh, terabyte of data to to get this uh, structure of the star so unfortunately python unable to handle that <laughs> okay and also uh, <coughs> we have to use ancient program what we call people say is ancient fortran fortran is very good in handling this kind of data so i don't know uh, we try actually we try to code to re, uh, redo this uh, cell evolution code in python but unfortunately uh, the precision the accuracy is so bad and you're unable to to do some precision up to what the fortran can do okay so that is uh, and we feel, we feel that oh, maybe we need we need some few generation of physicists to to recode this thing, to rewrite this code. And we find that no need to do that. We just stick whatever we have. So the <laughs> only things that we use Python is for to visualize our result. That will be the best thing, right? <laughs> so how the computational physics work? This is a very simple thing. I think most of people who do programming coding will know. So from equation of mass, okay? So some mathematical equation. So we transform into an algorithm and for algorithm, we write the code and from there we produce a result okay although it looks like a very simple thing but in the end when we test a code it requires a lot of testing debugging and also we have to test either your result is accurate or not how to how do you know the result is accurate or not first we have to redo the theoretical part it means that mathematical part we have to uh, to do the solution and see whether our computational will give you the same result the another part is we constrain with the experimental data. So we have experimental data, we have some modeling, and we see that is these two things agreeable. If it's not agreeable, we have to redo our code. It's as it's look as simple as that, but it requires a lot of work. Okay, so why Python? Because I'm focusing for the undergraduate teaching. So <clears throat> the idea is because it's free because I'm from public university. Public university don't have a lot of fun. <laughs> okay, so we are opting for the open source. Last time we, we chose uh, something compiler like MATLAB, Mathematica, but we cannot afford to pay uh, every year subscription. So we moved to something free and widely available and, and easy to learn. And you have a very good visualization. So we use Matplotlib. Matplotlib is um, because we need a vector image. Yeah? So vector image it means that uh, and is very powerful in handling some mathematical equation. So that's why we use this. Although there is a few uh, options for visualization, you can see in my slide later on. 
and they have a very good math and science library. So for teaching, I focus on only these two library, Nampi, SciPy, and Pandas, because these are the three things that undergraduate students should be able to pick up uh, at the first point when they start to learn coding. And of course, it's popular industry. So for uh, teaching, we have taught this uh, programming uh, back in, I think, around already 16 years in UM, but different uh, programming language, okay? So just currently when after I, <coughs> I come back uh, to teach at UM, so we decide that we have to teach uh, in the newer uh, computer language, so we choose Python, okay? So that is why previously we taught in Forefront, so since people say that using our Cochrane review, we say that student needs to know what is the latest trend and so on, Okay, let we try, we, we move to Python and see that how the student pick up this kind of language, okay? <coughs> so from here, we try uh, for this one, we use uh, Anaconda distribution for the student to install for themselves. And we choose uh, two, what they call it, uh, uh, either Jupyter or Spider for them to write a code, because why? Uh, when we, well, as a challenge when you uh, teach at the university, you find that even UM is uh, the oldest university in Malaysia. So those students who come into UM not really have a, a programming background. So that is extremely a challenge for us to, to teach them. So we have a very good student can do programming just like a blink of eye. We have a student who never see or never have an idea how to do a programming. So these are the tools that we, uh, we try uh, the best for us for the IDE because why people you can choose like Carol present this morning you can choose uh, Python from OS uh, packages or from the Python uh, for the website itself but the challenge is because they have to install the library independently so the student will struggle on that part so we, we find that this distribution is embedded everything the library the numpy panda everything inside this so when with a one click student able to install and everything is inside their laptop, as easy as that. Okay, so the student will learn <coughs> how to install. And from here, we can see that <coughs> this uh, distribution is very easy to install. They have built in uh, libraries, and so it support in multiple platform. They can have in either in Mac, in Windows, or even in Linux distro. So any uh, distribution should be fine. <coughs> okay, so what do we teach at the, our undergraduate? So this is a very nice binary star interaction by using vPython. I don't know whether we have heard about this one. So from here, uh, we ask a student, this is uh, distributed by some vPython website. You can go to the website and they have a very fantastic tutorial, but you have to uh, import some vPython libraries plus some what we call as a glow script to, to do this interaction, to do this uh, very nice uh, binary star interaction. So from here, the student that learn, this is only use a very simple Kepler uh, equation to do all this thing. Okay, so how does the code look like? Very simple, like this. This code is available at the vPython ORG. So student will, can learn um, how to, to visualize and also to write a code by themselves. They can, uh, what they call it, um, edit it and to, to do a different physics problem for this kind of uh, computation. So this is a Python code. It's also available in a Jupyter notebook. Okay, so I, uh, I choose uh, Python so that you can, student can uh, easily transform. If they have to use different laptop or different PC, they can easily uh, uh, <coughs> run it in any uh, computers. I Python, I mean Jupyter, they need to reinstall the Jupyter. So this is what we, <coughs> we try to uh, ask the student to do. And what do we teach students? Okay, so technically in UM, in our program, BSc uh, Physics, we have two courses. One is Numerical Computational Master, second year course, and it's compulsory, and I'm the one who's teaching it now. <laughs> okay, so another one is Computational Physics. So I share this code with another senior professor. This is a third year course, elective. So technically, we have a continuation. So the student have to take Numerical and Computational Physics before they can do Computational Physics itself. So it's a prerequisite. So it means that uh, at the first second year, we introduce students how to do coding, how to read libraries, how to do a 1D uh, what I call calculation, and after that, we move to more complicated problem. All right. 
Okay, so what are the the topics? The topic is since this is a, a what we call we have to solve a physics problem, the student needs to know how to do a scientific computing. For when when we speak about computing in the physics, error analysis is extremely important. Okay, so because error, we will know that how much the your result either is accurate or precise. Okay, so and also some good programming practice. It means that we always encourage students to write a very simple code. No fancy uh, what call, uh, code, no need to put a fancy header and everything just to get the physics correct with the correct uh, like equation, whatever algorithm that you have to put. Okay, so because a student sometimes are being too uh, excited when they want to do coding, they want to do very fancy things, but in the end, it will take require a lot of computing time. A lot of computing time means, for example, if you run some loop, it will endlessly uh, what you call it iterate that things until um, too long so we don't want that okay so we can do iteration but we have to optimize our calculation okay so since in uh, science or physics we deal a lot of data so we also teach students how to do some curve fitting or interpolation so this is for example cubic b spline b spline the student will learn how to to do the interpolation by giving some random data optimization is if you have a function we want to optimize where is your function either minimum or maximum they can see where is the solution and in physics we always deal with the linear and non-linear equation for example the Einstein field theory that uh, equation that you see just now is a non-linear problem so when it, we have a non-linear uh, equation we require um, what cost to to know which are the method is the best for them to solve for that kind of equation although they have another step to do that right and also we have some ODE, ODE, the one that I show you, the Maestel evolution equation, and also some numerical integration. So all these problems are purely in 1D only. We don't ask them to do 3D or uh, 2D or something for the first experience uh, for them to, to write a code. Okay. So for example, I give them some a simple nonlinear equation by uh, to solve some uh, exponential uh, equation, and they can choose. Two different method. This is what we call a bisection method and also Newton Raphson method. Although Python, they have the library for this. Okay. So, but I uh, what we emphasize is the student is they have to write the code by their own first, so that they will understand whatever library inside in the what they call it in Python or any libraries, so that if anything the new physics have to be solved, they can easily do it by themselves. Okay. So these two different method have a two different so one is you have to slice the result by using the range and you get what is the uh, what called the uh, average of the equation and then the, the next one is only the ratio okay so this is the equation that uh, sorry the program that student have to write and send to me okay so if you see the program i don't uh, there's not many subroutine okay so for the subroutine or the de define the only thing that we require is how they do the function then other this is just a very simple you can see this is kind of legacy of Pat of Fortran if for those who used to do coding okay so but this is the style of you can the student free to write their own style but we just want to get the they get the flow or the idea how to write the code okay <clears throat> so from here since Python have a very good visualization library. So this result is technically this one. Sorry, let me show you back again. So this result is actually come from Matplotlib, the, the plotting. So the student will learn not only to write a code, but also to visualize their result by using uh, this library. Okay. All right. So next i move to computational physics so computational physics require a bit more uh what they call it physics that they have to to learn or to understand so they have to solve what we call as a boundary value problem bvd so this is more like some uh either we can solve either for ordinary differential equation or partial differential equation that use a lot in physics or even in scientific uh, calculation so from here people uh student will learn how to deal with not only one equation but two equations simultaneously and they have to solve it so then we also have what we call as eigenvalue matrices where the student will learn how to deal with 
all these matrices to solve, for example, uh, some uh, equation in the Ascoli equation. They use, for example, for von Neumann equation, uh, sorry, von Neumann, um, what do you call it, uh, method to solve a certain part in the Ascoli equation. And for transformation, this is quite popular. The student will learn how to solve transformation, for example, for the fast Fourier transform, Hilbert transform, that used a lot in mathematical plus engineering and also in the physics. And what is the probability? Okay, so probability is the one that used a lot in science, especially in astronomy, where people solve by using, if you have a, a what called particle transport. We want to transport some particle, so we have some a large probability. So we use uh, one of the popular method probability is Monte Carlo method. If anyone have uh, at least uh, hear about it, so Monte Carlo method is also we move to the what we call as a machine learning or something like that, and also some uh, has been used for the AI. To, to, to see that how that <coughs> the problem can get towards the, uh, the random uh, distribution. Okay, so this is uh, only the graph that uh, the student able to produce by using our uh, calculation. Although the, the last one is technically, it is not related to physics, it's more to uh, stock analysis. But recently, our student, we sent our student to do uh, internship at the um, what they call it, uh, some banks, and they use this kind of things, the Monte Carlo method, to do the data analysis for the banking system. So this is where we can see that how the student use whatever they learn during the undergraduate can be applied to their internship. And uh, I mean, the, the people see that for oh, the student able to do some simple modeling, but will be more uh, what they call useful for industry. That is our goal technically, because most of you might know that people say that the STEM uh, in Malaysia is no work and everything. So we try to think out of the box by supplying them with the skill, not only the analytical skill for them to solve a problem, but plus with the programming skill, they have some add-on value uh, with their degree. So that is our idea. So physicists not really just end up to become a scientist, but they can become more than that. They can become a data analysis, they can, uh, do all of sort of autonomous, even they can go to the IT industry, might be some competitor to the people from the computer science. Sorry for that. Okay, so, <laughs> so that is one thing that uh, we will see for in the next five years to see how this, the student will the probability we hopefully to become more and more employed by the uh, <coughs> employer here in Malaysia. Okay, so this is one example that the student have done before, we have what we call a shooting method in ODE. Again, this is available uh, in a Python library, but for this case, we ask to, that the student to write themselves by using Ranskuta method for the uh, ODE and solve the two equations simultaneously. The life, and then we ask them to compare with the one that they get from the library to see how good it is. Okay, so here, what is the shooting method will do? You can start at any initial position, but you have to end up at the, the final solution. So this is only because this is undergraduate level, we don't ask them to plot a lot. So we just test one, uh, one line. So if they start any point, they can eventually I can uh, shoot to that, the final point. So this um, technique has been used a lot. And for example, to solve some boundary value problem, okay, to shoot, for example, like I do to, to solve what is the atmosphere problem between the center to the surface of the star. So, and this one we can shoot any point and in the end will reach at the, the point that can be observed by the observer or by the telescope. Okay. <laughs> okay, so this is uh, also plotted by Python. This is my research. This is, I forgot to put the, my paper here. Okay, so this is a sim uh, some sample that why the Python is for very powerful for uh, computational physics. So from here, since we require some vectorized image to do publication, so we choose to uh, to do a Python script to run uh, to plot what we call this is a HI diagram, Hesperus diagram <coughs> that um, show that the uh, how the star from the start until the end it works into. Uh, of the star okay so and also we find that this is for the surface of the star and this is also we can study internally how the star evolve from the center of the star to the surface and see that how the density and temperature will change and this is 
done, uh, the, the visualization is done by Python. And from there, we see that how powerful is it and it gives a very clear image uh, that's suitable for the publication. Okay, so this is being published by uh, in the APJ uh, last two years. Okay, so this is uh, we uh, able to have uh, because of some journals have a very uh, what do you call it um, a fussy requirement on how you want to produce a vector image. So we find that the Python since it's free, so we choose this one so that can we can increase whatever the the quality of the image and also the vectorize because we can save in PNG or SVG whatever. Okay, so that is what the the best thing about why Python is very suitable for, for teaching and also for research. Okay, so this is one of the results that my student using um, the calculate some neutrinos and energy loss by using Python and they visualize in a 3D. I'm sorry, I don't have the 3D movement because they he just sent me the picture like this. Okay, so from here, this is uh, some energy loss uh, produced by a branch some low process which is uh, depends on the temperature of the, the star itself. Okay, so this is only a, a, what they call it, a, this 1D XY image, and then the student able to transform <coughs> to a 3D where we, we put, for, for example, one uh, axis for the, um, uh, the temperature. Okay, so we'll see that how the difference of the neutron energy loss it depends on temperature and density will have this kind of the, this is actually for the temperature. Okay, so from here you can see that the student able to do this by uh, taking this course and they're able to visualize by themselves. And the good thing about Python is, the great thing that I'm very uh, grateful is they have pandas. Previous, <laughs> previously, okay, previously back I, I did, when I did my PhD 10 years ago, uh, we don't have pandas. So how do we deal with the all the data? We have to write dictionary. Dictionary is really, really tedious when you have millions of variables. Okay, for example, you have 100 uh, variables, so you have to write each one of them, uh, import ASCII file, and then you do the plot. Nowadays, everything, no need to do that. You just import Panda and they can uh, magically do all these things. Okay, so that is uh, the hard work that we have done a uh, long time ago. So, for example, the, the one that I show here, this is still using Python 2.7, so we write uh, a dictionary, we, we wrote a dictionary and then we also wrote some, we import some ASCII file. So if you miss one variable, the plot won't happen like this. <laughs> so it, it requires like, I think one year alone for me to, to write the script to produce a very simple plot like this. Okay, so because of, we have huge data and to read every column by Python is a bit uh, headache last time. But now, by using Panda, you just read the header and everything is automatically done that the student, this is the same data set. Okay, so uh, this one is student taking the data from uh, the, uh, uh, the paper and they just do some, some small work of the neutron energy loss. So that is, we'll see that how the different that a PhD student last time have to do like one year to write the code and the student nowadays can do it within like three weeks only to produce this, this kind of plot. Of course, the physics is not that correct. I mean, you can see the plot. He, he still have some disking. This is, he, he, he uh, what do you call it? He only read the data twice, but doesn't matter, but he get the idea how to do that. The, the, the thing is, don't worry about the student do some mistake. They learn along the way. We will fix it for, uh, that for them. No, don't worry. So from there, from here, <coughs> uh, the student will reread back again the data, but in the end, they able to understand how to get at least the correct shape for the, uh, the plot, okay? And also the physics behind it, they also have to understand. Okay, so this is our lovely student. So this is for our numerical student, and this is for computational student. So this is a second, third year student. We have two different things, okay? So you can see our second year student, technically half of them are girls. <laughs> okay. So technically in Malaysia, if uh, people ask me, we have a quite high ratio of a female student for undergraduate. So this is, they just finished my exam last time and they took a picture. This is examination hall at UM. For those who are from UM, uh, you should know where is it. Is the animation hall. Okay, so <laughs> they are half of, uh, they are the second year and this is 
since we uh, cater a lot of students so and we asked students to install this for the program so we did our uh, class in our seminar room like here and the student is uh, running some watercolor code i haven't take the i should take picture behind so they are running the code and we test them to get the result we we show the result in front and we ask them to get either the, your, the result is the same or not okay okay so this is uh, i went uh, in last year for astro hack i don't know any hacking thing here in malaysia so this is i went uh, last time 2018 in uh, lawrence institute leiden so uh, several people around the world uh, we are being uh, we went to this astro hack astro hack is done every year uh, then this year is in Cambridge, UK. Uh, so <coughs> we uh, we gather all the astrophysicists uh, around the world. We gather to a place where we uh, try to hack whatever uh, the new uh, what you call it a science or astrophysics problem. So this is also where I be introduced by AstroPi. So for those who have learned about black hole and everything, so this is where. The astro, they, they teach us how to do astro hack. Unfortunately, certain things cannot be run in your laptop. You require some high-end computer. So I cannot show the simulation because I don't think we have a, a internet connection here. Okay, so from here, um, that is where we try to hack certain astrophysics problem. And anyone feel to to uh, to join this thing, but uh, you require a bit background to do uh, this hacking. <laughs> okay, so thank you. So that's uh, my talk for today. I open to any Q&A.